Hey, well, good morning, everybody. Um, a period of grace to start our day with the time change and some snowy traffic, so we'll get going at 940. How's that? Um, anyways, glad you made it. Good to see you. Uh, before we uh, jump into our lesson today, we'll spend just a minute in prayer. Uh, anything that we can uh, remember to the Lord uh, for or for uh, other people in our Five Points family this morning. Brian? Um, could I ask your prayers for these shoulders and arms? Man, I'm in so much discomfort pain. Yeah. It's just bad. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Debbie? Just taking my mom. She had eye surgery. It's been like a month, um, and it's, she, she was really doing well in the beginning, and now it looks like we're going to set back. She's, uh, she's just having a, um, her, her, she has a back in her hole, and so it hasn't closed. Okay. So um, she can't drive, so I have to do all her driving and stuff like that for her. Yeah. Yeah. So I right. just uh, pray that she, you know, that heals. Yeah, sorry to hear that. I hope you will. Yeah. All right. Yes. Okay. It depends on if you're waving at me or raising your hand. Claudia. Oh. To us, uh, we can take a look in creation and on a morning like this, as the snow falls, it reminds us of you. Um, but uh, even more so, you've revealed yourself to us in the written word, and so we thank you that you have. Um, and Lord, uh, even more so, you have revealed yourself to us in the incarnate word, uh, the person of Jesus. Uh, you have uh, shown us who you are in him. And so, Lord, we uh, thank you so much. Um, for those things that you have done for us today. We pray that we would be more and more mindful of them um, so that we would uh, have the right perspective that those things um, bring uh, into our life so that we would continue to uh, learn to be uh, the people that you have called us to be, uh, people who live by faith and not by sight. Um, and that's important for us, Lord. Uh, we all know that, but uh, sometimes the things in life uh, press that uh, reality uh, upon us and we feel it in more um, uh, heavy ways and so as we uh, deal uh, with um, our frail bodies and we feel the pain and um, we go through those difficulties we think of our brother Brian and his arms and shoulders Lord uh, we thank you that you know um, that you actually know what it's like to, to be human um, in the person of Jesus and so as the writer of Hebrews tells us we thank you that now we know that we have uh, not only access to you, but we know that you know what it's like um, to be human and, um, and that you care about that. And so for our brother Brian, we uh, ask that those truths uh, would encourage him, even in the midst of his difficulties, um, as he continues to uh, struggle with those physical things, that it might be um, actually an open door uh, to lean into Jesus and the sufferings that he endured um, and to see how you work uh, suffering together um, for your people uh, to bring about resurrection. And so we pray that those truths would be uh, fresh on not only Brian's uh, minds, but on ours as well as we go through things and help others. So uh, go through this too. So Debbie, as she continues to take care of her mom, we pray that you would give her the strength uh, to do so. Uh, we pray that she would encourage her along the way, um, both her and her mom. Um, Lord, we uh, sometimes it takes the wind out of our sails after we've gone through a procedure that's supposed to help and uh, find out that it's uh, actually not. And so we uh, thank you, though, Lord, that we're not dependent at the end of the day on medicine and technology and surgeries, uh, but upon you. And so we pray that uh, you would uh, heal Debbie's mom's eye uh, and that it would be just another um, 
testament to your uh, sustaining grace and faithfulness. And then, Lord, for uh, Claudia, she continues to seek to care for her brother, Claude. Thanks, Lord, for opening up a door of opportunity for her with all the things going on in our hospitals that she might be able to spend some time there um, with Claude. And pray that would be a sweet time um, for both of them. Um, pray that you would provide a, a ride for our sister that she might be able to get there and uh, take advantage of this opportunity. That's incredible. And, uh, Lord, we um, turn now um, and ask that you would help us as we spend time in uh, your word again. Uh, not only us, Lord, but um, all over this uh, building as, um, as uh, people from all ages, from um, kids uh, all the way to the oldest of us, have another opportunity to hear from you. And we pray that your spirit would take these, uh, these seeds of your word and uh, would plant them deeper into us and that you would continue to water those and uh, continue to grow uh, faith in us. And it's in Christ's name that we pray these things. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are uh, continuing on in uh, lesson 13. If you're following um, along, I um, split the lesson in two uh, because I'm the teacher, um, and I can. So uh, we did it. Um, there was a lot of content there, so I thought it would be helpful for us to be able to, um, to do that. So um, Philippians chapter 3, uh, if you have your Bibles, would you meet me there? As we continue uh, our study on what it means to be united with Christ, uh, dying and rising with Jesus in everyday life. If you're turning there, just a bit of a review from last week. Lesson 13 is called The Jesus Journey. Um, and last week, we considered the first half of Paul's grace metaphor for the Christian life. Uh, and that first half was forgetting what lies behind. Um, today, we're going to uh, consider the second half, remembering that while everybody's in a race, a Christian is one who follows Paul as he follows Jesus. Okay, so we're going to consider the second half that is uh, pressing forward or straining forward. And as we do so, we want to remember the reality that everybody is in a race. So that means everybody, um, Christians, non-Christians, everybody's in a race. Um, that's because everybody is in something. You are either in Christ or you're in something else, whether that's your uh, uh, educational pedigree or how much money you make or on and on it goes. Everybody locates themselves in something. Um, we are either a child of God or a child of wrath. We are either a sheep or a goat. We are either a friend of God or a friend of the world. There is no in-between neutral ground here. So then as we consider something like the race metaphor for the Christian life, it's important that we remember that everybody is in a race. Um, a Christian, though, is one who follows Paul as he follows Jesus. All right, so... Um, this is uh, a bit of what we looked at uh, last week. I at least put the put this chart on the screen. So um, if you weren't here, uh, you get it for the first time. If you were and totally forgot, that's okay. We're going to go through it again. Um, our passage is Philippians chapter 3, um, 9 to 21. So um, before I read that, I want to show you... Um, what we find in that that has to do with this race or uh, journey metaphor. So we have a map, and that map is the pattern of Jesus dying and rising. Um, just to point out the obvious, this is at the heart of our class. Uh, dying and being united with Jesus is dying and rising with him. So the map that we have in Scripture for us is... Uh, this pattern of Jesus dying and rising. Um, who is our guide? Yes. Jesus. Yes. But more specifically in our passage today. You've seen it before. 
I'll give you a, a clue if you want to use the Mike Shirt taking a test or quiz technique. You can just look at what the teacher already said on the board and hopefully that supplies the answer for you. So a Christian is one who follows Paul as he follows Jesus. So he says it in our passage. He says it elsewhere. Um, follow me as I follow Jesus. But not only me, it's pretty cool that he says in our passage that it's actually follow not only me, but also all who follow Jesus. So, but specifically in our, in our situation, for, or in our passage, Philippians 3, our guide is Paul himself. Uh, our goal, anybody remember this from last week? What's the goal in our race? Where are we headed? Heavenward. Heavenward. Yeah, ultimately there's this resurrection with Jesus. So the resurrection, um, a perspective that's helpful for us on this journey or race that we see here. Uh, a perspective is that we aren't there yet. That's helpful. Uh, especially for a long obedience in the same direction. It's helpful to have that perspective. And then lastly, a warning is don't follow people who are running a different race. Yeah, Mike, that's a you. I thought you were going to get the door. You may be getting a cup of coffee, but whatever you want to do. Uh, so the warning, don't follow people who are running a different race, okay? So, thinking about this race metaphor, thinking about this journey metaphor, this is what we um, have been given by God to help us. So here is the passage. It's on the screen, or you can uh, read along in uh, your copies of the Bible. Philippians chapter 3, 9 through 21. Uh, Paul says that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, and then again that, or, uh, that word is brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straying forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many, of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame, with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Okay, so can you see the map in there? For our journey, it's dying and rising with Jesus. Can you see the guide in there? It's Paul there, joining and imitating me. Keep your eyes on those. The goal is resurrection. Um, the perspective, we're not there yet. The warning, don't follow people who run a different kind of race. Um, with that last part, uh, where in our passage do you see um, uh, a comparison, a parallel between the race that we the race that we run as Christians with a beginning, middle point, and an end, compared with the race that enemies of the cross run? Do you see anything in there? Do they have a beginning, middle, or an end goal? They're lost. Well, they are lost, it doesn't mean they're not pursuing something. Yeah, so what is their, so I'm just trying to show us again that everybody's in a race, and they are, what is their end, verse 19? Their end is destruction. Their God or their guide is what? 
their belly, just their, their flesh, their internal desires, and they glory in their shame with minds set on what? <laughs> Earthly things. So everybody's in a race, Christians and non-Christians, and so we want to know as followers of Jesus, we are, what is this race that God has given us uh, to run? All right, so um, as we get into the second half, our first question is this. Uh, where is Paul himself on this journey? Has he reached the end? Okay, use the words that he tells us here. Let's talk about it together. Where is Paul himself on this journey? And he does that. What does he say right before that? Has he reached his end yet? Verse 12? Yeah. He, say it again. Not that I have already obtained this. Okay, yeah. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. Okay, so um, we have this already not yet reality in Scripture. Have you heard of this before? Sometimes. Uh, theologians like to go on and on and on and on about that. But it's true. It's there in Scripture. It's helpful for us. It's the perspective that we need to think through this already, not yet perspective. Uh, and we see it um, all over in Scripture, but specifically as we're considering this journey, this race that Christians are in, verse 12, Paul says, not that I have already obtained. Um, now, the the, all, the already component is what that we also see there in our passage today? He died in Christ in his death and resurrection. His okay. Son, yeah. yeah, so it, this has already happened. Right, so here's this already not yet thing that we have going on. Um, I love how Paul says it, though. Um, look at verse 12. He says, not that I have already obtained this. What is the obtained this? What's he talking about? The previous verse, right? The ultimate goal of resurrection. Um, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Why does he do that? What has already taken place? Christ is making his own. Do you get, do you get that? Do you believe that? That is beautiful. Christ has already made me his own. Wow. How did he do that? He lived this perfect life that me and you were supposed to, but didn't. He, he became our representative. More than that, he became our substitute. And through his precious blood, he made us his own. That's beautiful. So this is the fuel for us as Christians as we think through the race that we're in. This already not yet. So by faith, we are already united with Christ in his death and resurrection. But at the same time, we are still waiting in hope for the final resurrection. All right. Um, so we are also already dead to sin. But yet, uh, but we are not yet dead to sin. We are still fighting Right? Can you think of another place where Paul talks about how we should consider this or think about this? This specific idea of dead to sin, but not dead to sin, still fighting. As you think about that, do you experience this in your Christian life? I do. <laughs> and it's a good thing that Scripture says that this is what will happen to us. Okay. It's already in front of it, of, of us. Any other places, though, where we hear Paul talk about this idea of, of thinking about already not yet, specifically as it relates to dead to sin but still fighting? Romans 7. Okay, yeah, Romans 7. Uh, elaborate. <laughs> Put in your own words. Give us the line back. The very thing, very thing Paul wants to do, that's what he finds himself mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Vice versa. Yeah, so the things that he wants to do to please God, he finds himself I'm not doing those things. What is wrong with me? Uh, you're a human, Paul. You're already not yet. But thanks be to God, right, who gives us the victory. 
Um, in previous to chapter 7, chapter 6, he tells us to consider ourselves that we are dead to sin. We have to think that way because that already happened for us. Why do we have to think that way? Because we still battle it. Is something wrong with us or is this is the plan? This is the plan. This is where we find ourselves. This is the perspective for us. So we are already dead to sin, but we are not yet dead to sin. We're still fighting. So this idea of already, it looks at the past by faith. And not yet looks to the future in hope. So already looks at the past by faith. Right? We are believing in what Jesus has done for us. Not yet looks to the future in hope. Because God has given us promises that he will bring us to pass. He's the one who began the good work, and what will he do? He will complete it. He will finish it. Um, so, there in verse um, 12 again, we want to ask the question, we've answered it already, how do you see both already and not yet in chapter 3, verse 12? Not that I have already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Okay? Um, Paul in verse 9 makes this uh, pretty big claim um, about this idea of him being declared righteous or this righteousness that he has. How does already not yet Help us understand Paul being declared righteous there in verse 9. Where he says, And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. So Paul is talking about, I no longer look to what I can do to earn right standing with God. I tried it, he says. And it was empty. So now I am looking, by God's grace, to Christ. And as I am doing that, I am declared righteous. So how does the already not yet help us to understand what Paul, how, how he can say that he has um, been declared righteous? Any thoughts on that? Could you just stop on a time change, snow like kind of morning, huh? <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> yes. So, how does already not yet that theological concept, how does that help us understand a little bit more what Paul is saying in verse 9 that he has been declared righteous? Claudia? Uh, in verse 9, it says, but which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So he has faith. Yeah, he has faith in who? God. In Jesus, specifically. And because he does, what is the legal declaration that God has made for those who are trusting in Jesus? Righteous. 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 Okay. Uh, so Paul is already righteous. By faith in Jesus. He's already made perfect in Christ. So hang on to that for a second. So if you are trusting in Jesus, you are robed in the righteousness of who? Praise God. Jesus. Jesus. You are already made perfect. Amen. Such that if Jesus returns right now and we stand before him as our judge, what will we hear? Forgiven. Welcome. Welcome good Righteous, good and faithful. Right? That is beautiful. So this, this idea of already not yet is not just like some cool sound and theological stuff that we can write books about. This is this is for us for every day living with Jesus. Everyday life as a follower of Christ. As we bump into what? Sin again. My sin, right? Being sinned against again. Other sins. What is our foundation? If you are in Christ. Christ is justification by faith. That's my foundation. 
So I'm no longer looking, this is how it comes out in our life. so I'm no longer looking to be declared righteous by anybody else. It doesn't matter, right? Because the only one that truly does matter, God, has declared me righteous because Great. of Jesus. Great. So we can stop the failure boasting chart kind of stuff. Because we're already perfect in God's sight. And as we do that, how then do we engage with others? Not perfectly, but a little bit better. Because we're not angling anymore. We're not on that failure boasting chart. <coughs> so now we can not more, not, not uh, perfectly, but a little bit more easily die to ourselves when we want to get ourselves up on that failure boasting chart. Because I'm united with Jesus. I, there is nothing else for me to climb. I'm already there. So this is just where this stuff um, lives, lives out. All right. Um, so let's, uh, let's move on then. Um, I already worked our way through this, the not yet, not that I've already obtained this, or I'm already perfect. Already I press on to make it my own because Jesus, or Christ Jesus has made me his own. Um, worked through uh, Paul's idea or reality of um, being declared righteous, um, not yet completely Jesus-like. Okay, so um, if already refers to the past, already made righteous, and not yet to the future, what's missing? Right now. No. Right now. Yes. Right in the present. Right? So if already refers to the past, not yet to the future, what's missing? What is missing is um, the present. Uh, my... There's some movie that's in my brain right now, Kung Fu Panda or something, that got some thing that Bo says about the present, and I'll butcher it up. But anyways, my kids will ask my kids about the saying from Kung Fu Panda and the present. It's a gift. That's why it's called the present. So much that anyways. And now, so the present. That's right. Um, according to Philippians three eight to twenty one, what does Paul's present look like? Just boil that. Boil that stuff down. What's what's his present look like? Does that Present. resonate with you at all? What's his yeah, it's pressing on. Yeah, yeah. Tim? Suffering. Suffering. Yeah. Battle. Say it again. Battle. Battle. Yeah. Right. Loss. Um, say it again. Loss. Loss. Yeah. Yeah. Say it again? Death. Death, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, at least at this point, since we're still here, that metaphorical death, right? Of picking up your cross and doing what to yourself? Dying to yourself. Dying to yourself. Uh, it looks like the J curve. I get $5 every time I say that from. <laughs> uh, it's the J curve. It's dying and rising with Jesus. That's what the present looks like. Um, now, we can, as Paul Miller says in the study, we can expand our slogan to already, not yet, right now. Um, so, yes, the already, not yet is there, but also we've got to live. So there's this right now uh, component that is at play. Um, the gospel affects our past, present, and future. Beautifully so. Thankfully so. The gospel affects our past, our present, and future. Okay, so if you're anything like me, sometimes we can dwell on the past and what Jesus has done for us, and that's a right thing to think about, and the future, what will happen to us, but this in-between stuff, have a tough time kind of connecting the dots of what it looks like to follow Jesus now. But the past and the future is meant to shape us in how we live right now. What Christ has done for us and what's coming. Um, our lesson today primarily is going to focus on the future. Because that's what Paul is talking about here. His goal, his aim, he cannot wait for the resurrection. Because his lowly body will be made like what? Christ's glorious body. So no more hand and shoulder aches and no more visiting loved ones and 
the hospital and no more struggles with sin because we will be made like Jesus. So that's the future hope, and that's our focus today. Um, I get to do a double whammy today. So I'm preaching today on hope, and the hope that we also have in Scripture is also based on the past. So it is the future, it is the past, and both of those things shape us in the present. It's, it's sweet that God is all over the place with us and for us in these things. Okay, so um, let's uh, illustrate this idea a little bit more with uh, a couple of charts. Um, charts sometimes are helpful, but if you get a bunch of stuff on the charts, then it kind of looks like what? But sorry, that's what Miller does and things, so we're going to get a bunch of stuff on these charts. Uh, the first one is... is um, uh, not so bad, but the second one's got a lot going on. Okay, so uh, the gospel affects our past, present, and future. Okay, um, We want to make sure that we are clear on what the gospel is. Um, sometimes we can lose sight of it. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, for example, let me remind you of what the gospel is. And what is the gospel? It's that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture and was raised again on the third day. So, when we're thinking about the gospel, it is this Jesus' death and resurrection. Okay, so that's, that's the good news. Um, object, objectively, subjectively, meaning the benefits to us come by believing then in what Jesus has done for us. Alright, so as we're thinking through those things... In this past, present, and uh, future idea, we can look at it this way. The past, Jesus' death for us is finished. Because we are in him and have already died with him, our sins are already paid for. We have been declared righteous. Already, by faith, we have died with Christ and are raised with him. So the phrase that we use there is this already for us. I mean, it kind of makes sense. Thankfully, it's not too hard for us to grasp. The concepts are deep because we're talking about things of the Lord here. But um, So past is what happened uh, in the phrase. The future. We look forward to the future resurrection when our new bodies will match our new hearts. I like how Miller says that. Um, we look forward to the future resurrection when our new bodies will match our new hearts. We've not yet received this, but we taste the future resurrection now by the Spirit's presence in our lives. So there's this not yet component going on. This is the future. <clears throat> then the present. Uh, this really gets to the heart of our study because we are trying to make some strides. We're trying to uh, grow a little bit more. What does it mean? To be a follower of Jesus. And so it means believing upon Jesus, yes, but it also means becoming like Jesus in his death and resurrection. So I think a lot of times it's the former that gets a lot of the conversation, um, and, and not all bad. Believing in Jesus, okay. But the rest of, like, what's my life now? Well, it's becoming like Jesus. That's what a Christian is, one who is believing upon Jesus and becoming like Jesus in his death and resurrection, okay? So the present, we reenact Jesus' death and resurrection right now in the present. That is the pattern of our lives between Jesus' past resurrection and our future resurrection. The work of love right now makes the work of faith already real. Love makes faith present. So let's just let that one sit on here for a second. The work of love makes the work of faith real. So it's, it's uh, the Apostle Paul and, and James talking about faith and how it shows up in our lives and all these sorts of things. Uh, the work of love, okay, and that is really important, and it should show up in our lives because Jesus says all of the commandments hang on what? Yeah. Hang on two things. 
They both have to do with love. One is love for God, and the other is love for who? Our neighbors. Our neighbors. So, so the work of love, it's not just some abstract thing that hangs out there. The work of love, it's, it's me loving Jesus and loving others. It's going to cost me something. But I can lean into that because I have everything that I need in Jesus. And I have no risk of missing out on anything. So the work of love makes the work of faith real. Believing. Hearing God's commandments and obeying and responding. So love makes faith present. So we have, we have these uh, concepts and categories in front of us that, um, depending on where you're at in the journey, where you're at on the race of the Christian race, this may be newer to you, this may be uh, really old and crusty, but uh, we need to continue to grow in this awareness of there is the past, thankfully. There is the future, but there is the present. What does that look like? Present has this idea of dying and rising um, with Jesus. Okay, so, um, Claudia, did you have a question? Is it a good one? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, good. Yeah, great. That's a great word. Yeah, Claudia is drawing our attention to verse 16, where we hear this present idea, only let us hold true right now. Let us hold true to what we have attained. There's this present going on there. Yeah, Eric. Um, I don't mean to confuse things, but... Hey, you want to see this? I'm going to... I've got this big old thing that's going to confuse us all, so don't worry about it. It seems when Paul says in 12, he goes, not that I have already obtained this. So it's almost like Paul is saying, not already. Well, he is that. because of what specific though is he talking about in verse 11. So that's why I don't know what the this necessarily is. Does it mean resurrection of the dead, or does it refer to faith? In Christ. Yeah, so I think it is the ultimate resurrection because Paul has no heebie jeebies or in between or uncertainty about what Christ has obtained for him already. So much so that he's willing to say, I'm done with that old way of living because I have obtained in Jesus everything that I need. So in verse 12, when he says, Not that I have already obtained, he's not talking about. Is standing with God in righteousness there. He's talking about the resurrection. He's still struggling. His lowly body has not yet been transformed into the glorious body like Jesus is. So I, I think that's what he's getting. Any other thoughts on it? Well, and then, and then he says, uh, the, the idea of make it my own. I mean, just the work that, just, I mean, I'm sure there's a translation of things, but my own. You know, a righteousness of my own earlier, yep. that's not it. And that yet yeah, there's this possessiveness of pressing on to make it my own again. Yeah, so I, I don't know, just there's some word. Yeah, yeah, then. I, I think that's just, he's saying that sanctification. It goes to the work out your own salvation with fear and trembling towards God and work in you. Jesus has already made all his own, so justification wise, it's already settled. But sanctification-wise, none of us are going to be complete in this life, but Paul's whole goal is to get as close to that as he possibly can before he meets Jesus face-to-face. -face. So it's that struggling with all of his energy that he works with him that he talks about earlier. Like, and when he says what we've already obtained, I think he's talking about is whatever point you are at in your own sanctification, continue to live in accordance with that while still straining forward to become or more like Jesus. So, you know, it, it's hard to follow after Jesus and to continue dying to yourself. And there's days 
that I just don't want to do it anymore, you know? Like, I did that this week up to this point, but I don't want to do it anymore. And so what Paul is saying is continue to live in accordance with where God's already brought you, but also continue to strain forward until the day when you're finally 100% perfect and complete, your sanctification's over, you're finished. He's talking about still being a work in process. So he's straining forward for that, that, that way he's not already obtained is that final, completed sanctification that he'll have when he's with the Lord finally. But in the meantime, he constantly wants to keep becoming more and more like Jesus. Yeah, that's helpful. There's one. Well, if, if you just go from 12 where he has not obtained it to how he finishes that section of 14, he continues to press on, just like Ben was saying. Yeah, yeah. Toward the goal of being heavenward in Christ. Yeah. And yeah. with that second part of the further sanctification. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. Uh, just to kind of illustrate how kind of confusing, but yet um, order it is in what has happened in the past, what we look forward to in the future, and what's going on right now. Um, Miller gives us um, this uh, fuller chart. Um, don't look at it to like memorize it. Don't look at it to be like, I've got to keep all of these categories in my brain at the same time. I cannot. It's to illustrate the beauty of the gospel and that it affects our past, present, and future. Okay? All right. So, already, right now, not yet. So, past, present, future. Okay, we've got that. Much is clear. Let's just go on because that's... It's easy enough. Past, present, future. So past is the work of faith. Present is the work of love. The reason I am pressing on is because I am constrained by the love of Christ. So I focus on what Christ has done for me. It blows my mind, but he treats me this way. That comes out in the way that I treat others. So I love him and I love others, the work of love. And the future is the work of hope. So already, justification. Legally declared, past tense, righteous, by God. Right now, I think I heard the term sanctification. This is our ongoing work. And this is why Paul says in Romans 7, what is wrong with me? You're a work in progress, Paul. Right? So, that's for us as well. Not yet is glorification. Already declared righteous. Right now becoming righteous. Not yet completely righteous. Declared righteous. Becoming righteous. Completely righteous. Completely righteous. What must that mean? Uh, heaven. Amazing, yeah. Uh, so already, being who I am, becoming, that's who I am becoming, and not yet what I will be. So, what does that mean, who I am? Because that sounds a little confusing with the present, who I am becoming. We are declared righteous, and yet we are battling. Yeah. Yeah. The old man. So yep. We're in a weird dichotomy. Really. Yes. Yeah. Weird dichotomy indeed. Yeah. Um, think of, remember what Paul says in 2 Corinthians, talking about this stuff. If anyone is in Christ, what? New creation. The, the uh, I'm not a Greek scholar, but the Greek there is just abrupt. It is. Anyone is in Christ, new creation. Okay, so that's already who I am, new creation. Uh, right now, who I am becoming, and not yet what I will be. There's this idea of participation, practice, perfection. Participating in what Christ has done for us. Practice. You gotta work it out. Work out your salvation. 
Why? What's our hope in there? Remember, God never commands his people without enabling us. Work out your salvation because who's at work in you? Christ is at work in you. Oh, man, thank you. Um, why were the disciples to hold steady until the Spirit came? Because without the Spirit, can we live? Oh, so God is at work that encourages and fuels our practice. Already, we are united with Christ in His death and resurrection. By faith. Right now, we are dying and rising with Christ on a daily basis of love. And then our future, not yet resurrected bodies, no more death. United with Christ and his death and resurrection. Back there. Right now, dying and rising with Christ on a daily basis of love. And future, not yet resurrected bodies, no more death. Already sons and daughters of God. Right now, becoming sons and daughters by learning to pray, obey, and believe. Not yet fully, completely a son or daughter of God in his presence, fully transformed. So you'll memorize this and we'll have a quiz next Sunday. Uh, actually, we won't have a quiz, and we won't uh, even be discussing this because we have the privilege of having some missionaries back with us and uh, giving them the Bible study hour. Okay? Um, so let me just let me just take that in closing and and lay it on top of our passage, Philippians three nine to twenty one. Okay, this idea of already, not yet, uh, right now. Um, so, we just read, and as I do, we'll make these notes about this past, present, right now, reality. So, again, three nine. Um, that I may be that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. My past is now radically reshaped. By faith in Christ, I am counted righteous. That stops me from striving in the present to create my own righteousness. The more that happens, the more we smell like Jesus, and that is a sweet savor. Contrasted to the, or the smell of death that this world is used to breathing. So my past is now radically reshaped, and because it has been, that stops me from striving in the present to create my own righteousness. Let's keep reading verses 10 and 11. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. My presence is being reshaped by Jesus' past story. He provides the new map of my life. The new map of our lives is becoming like Jesus in his death and resurrection. My presence being reshaped by Jesus' past story, he provides the new map of my life. Reading verses 12 to 13. Not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I don't consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straying forward to what lies ahead. I'm not in the future yet, I live between Jesus' past, death, and resurrection and my future resurrection. So Paul is working through there, verses 12 and 13. I'm not in the future yet. I live in between Jesus' past, death, and resurrection and my future resurrection. Verses 13 and 14. So, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. Sorry. Uh, yep, made it my own. Um, verse 14, but I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Focusing on the future resurrection gives me zeal for the present. Focusing on the future resurrection gives me zeal for the present. If you're struggling along in your Christian race slash journey, 
Remember the promises of God. Remembering the promises of God, of past, what he's done, how he uses his power to bring about his promises for us, helps us to struggle along because of what he has promised to do. So we know that he's faithful. What has he promised in the future? That's amazing. Focusing on those things gives me life, zeal for the present. Uh, verses 15 to 19. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you, and I will tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Therein is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. These people live only from their present circumstances, themselves, their pleasure, and they're on a journey that sadly ends in death. And then we wrap up this section going into 20. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. I can't wait for the future when Jesus comes back and resurrects us all, giving us new bodies that fit our new hearts. The future gives me hope in the present. So, uh, the truths of Scripture are for us as individual children of God, but they are also for us to come alongside of others. So, there's lots of different levels of situations that we bump into as you're listening to a struggling brother and sister in Christ. Use these categories to help you think through how you can help them. Are they focused on the past? Are they struggling with the present? Are they wondering about the future? The gospel affects all of those categories. So just be slow to hear, or quick to hear and slow to speak. And that slowness is because there's lots to process through, but the Spirit helps us along. And for me, one of the things that keeps people around me need this to. And so process your way through those things. Past, what has God done? Who am I in Jesus? What does he promise for me in the future? And how does that show up in my life today? That gives hope and encouragement and fuel for us as we are becoming like Jesus in this present, in his death and resurrection. So, a um, couple of questions. Just, just a comment. Uh, to be more comments, more contributions. <laughs> yes. says, and if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. And to me, that's encouraging because he doesn't say, let them be a curse. Yeah. Right? Yes. So this, this is not a passage that <laughs> yeah. most people who come to faith in Christ immediately gravitate to and say, man, I want to do me some stuff. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, but as we mature and we regress what Christ has done for us and what our hope is for the future, we're able to think of this suffering. You know, in a sense, this is a hard teaching. Yeah. In, in, in a very real sense. Yeah. And I just thank God that He doesn't hold us accountable for having everything figured out all the time. Thank God. And it's yes. a growing yeah. relationship and a growing understanding yeah. of His greatness. Yeah, good work, Ken. Thanks. Elizabeth? So, in the second point there um, about my present is being mm -hmm. shaped by Jesus' past story and Barnabas' you know, the Christ death and resurrection, mm -hmm. I do think it's important to consider. That the resurrection is present for us. Yes. Jesus yeah. is, he is currently resurrected. Yes. He's currently alive and at the right hand of God. Yeah. Because he is present in that way, I think we need to be remembering we're not just focusing on his death. Yes. And the thing that happened yeah. in the past and the past of his resurrection. Yeah. But our hope and our present is shaped by his active yeah. existence yeah. as uh, the resurrected Lord. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so it is that um, there is that metaphorical sense of dying, picking up a yeah. cross, but also.
also uprising. Yeah. So we ought to be, uh, Paul Miller will say this, and I think I'm going to add some bonus material to our unit here, but um, we should be hunting for resurrections. Mm -hmm. it, it instills in us, because Christ is raised and is at work, we should be looking for resurrections all over the place. Relationships and situations, and we can do that because the Spirit of God is in it. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, thanks for those last uh, comments. Those are good. Let me um, wrap up with a word of prayer. So, Lord, we do thank you uh, for your beautiful work of grace. Uh, we're thankful for what has happened. We're thankful for what you have promised us, and we're thankful that you continue to be at work in us right now. Uh, and you are at work in us right now, but you are also, by your Spirit, at work in the world. You are bringing conviction. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would uh, help us to be more mindful of all of these things, um, encouraged by the fact that you are at work, that your purposes continue to unfold. And uh, so we just pray that all of those things would instill hope in us um, to be who you've called us to be. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.